This is the second tutorial in building models with Witness and we're going to build a model quite similar to the one we built in the first tutorial but we're going to make more use of the floating toolbar. We're going to introduce you to active part arrivals, look at distributional timings and a little bit more on the statistical reports. So what we're going to do again as in the first tutorial we're going to drag a part on from the designer element. For this time we're going to go up to the name in the floating toolbar and we're going to type in P1 and then to write that away we're going to press return on the keyboard. That's an easy way of writing uh, the name change away. Then this time we're going to put a buffer next followed by a machine and I forgot to do the naming on the buffer here, so let's just right click again to bring up the floating toolbar. And we can just call that one B1 and press return. I can then do the same for the machine here. I can make that M1 and press return. We can bring another buffer in here, which we'll call B2 and press return and a final machine which we'll call M1, M2 and press return. And again as in the first model we're going to change the quantity by right clicking and using the little numerical counter here to change the quantity of machine 2 to 2. Now we're also going to use uh, the floating toolbars to change some of the timings in the model. So if we right click on the machine one, M1, and we go to this button here, this pull down, and click on the little arrow, we can see a little properties grid opens up. And we'll put a, a timing of three time units in there. Now to write that away, we have to just click in another field and then click away. And then that field, that value will be written into the value of the cycle time of M1. Similarly for M2, we'll go to the properties and here we'll put in a cycle time of 5.9 and click elsewhere and then click away from it at that right side of the way. We're now going to do the routing in the model and this time we're going to click on P1 and we're going to push this actively into the model. Now as soon as I press this button we get a warning up that I'm changing the selected part to have active arrivals. Do I want to continue? Yes, we do. We want it to have active arrivals and push actively into buffer B1. This is different to what we did in uh, the first tutorial where we pulled it out of world uh, from machine one. So now the parts are arriving into the model under their own steam. We press OK again. And we do what we did in the previous tutorial. We click on M1 and we're going to pull using the visual input rule from B1. OK. And we're going to push using the visual output rule to B2. And then similarly for M2, we're going to pull from B2. And we're going to push using the visual output rule to ship. And OK that change. Again, we can check with view element flow and see that all those rules have been defined and it seems we're in good order. Now we can go into uh, the floating toolbar for P1 again. There are properties in here and we can change the inter arrival time of parts into here. So be once every six time units click somewhere else and then click away. Now there is a, a way to look more fully at the detail of the elements uh, that we are defining and that's by double clicking on any of the elements in the window. So if I go into on to, uh, over P1 and double click with the left mouse button it brings up the full detail for the part. The floating toolbar has certain amounts of information but mo a lot of information can only be changed by going into this detail dialog. 
And this tells us everything we need to know about the part. In this, it says active arrivals. The first arrival will be at time zero. There's the intro arrival time that we enter via the floating toolbar. We can get to the rules here. Uh, we can see it's a push rule. If I go into the little dialog, we can see it's a push to be one rule. And we could even edit the rules in here. But the toolbars are probably the easiest way to add the rules, but some of the detail will need to be entered on these dialogues. So similarly, if we look at the dialogue for, for the buffer, there's a dialogue for the buffer saying that things go into the buffer at the rear and they come out at the front, which is a sensible default. For the machine, M1, we have the cycle time of 3.0 here, and it's a single machine. There are other types of machines, such as batch, assembly and production, but here it's just a single machine. It's going to pro process a single part at a single time and take 3.0 time units to do that. And we can see the pull and push rules on this dialogue as well. So that's a way of getting to the more comprehensive dialogue of detail. The floating toolbar just allows you access to some of the common properties, such as the name and the uh, single cycle time for a single machine. So we've defined all the timings and we've defined all the uh, routings. So now we can run the model. We'll turn the little walkman on again and we'll watch the part flow through the model. And everything seems to be working. It's a good idea to do this at regular times when you're building a model to check that the logic that you've put in so far is working well. So I'm going to stop the run again by pressing the right mouse button and re-zero by pressing the begin button down here on the run toolbar. And then I'm going to introduce another part into this model. I'm going to right click on P1 and I'm going to clone it. And I'm going to place it below P1 and it's, it's called P2 by default. It will add one to the last uh, number digit. Now we want P2s to look a little bit different to P1. So I'm going to right click on here and use the floating toolbar icon selector to select a red icon here instead for this P2. And we just select it and then we can click away. Now, because we cloned P1, the rule for pushing to B1 and the inter-arrival time will be the same as for P1. So they will both be pushing to B1 at the same time. So let's run the model and see how that looks. And we can see at time zero there, two parts came in, one P2 and one P1. And they're both flowing through the system in the same way. Let us do a little formal experimentation with this model. Let us type into the run toolbar here next to the alarm button a time of 10,000, 10,000 time units. And let's make sure that little alarm button has got the colored surround behind it. And what we now want to do is to batch the model to that time. So we press the batch key and the model runs really, really quickly to that time. And it's now already reached 10,000 time units. Now to look at the statistics this time, I'm going to go to the simulation part of the tree that lists all the elements. And I'm going to tick the top box. That will automatically select all the elements that are visible in the tree below that. And I can right click on there and choose statistics. And this is another way of bringing up all the statistics in turn. First, we get the part statistics and we can see that the average time for P1 has been 8.9 in the system and the average time for P2 has been 11.89 uh, or 11.9. Moving through to the buffer statistics, we can see that the average size uh, and the average time in buffer B1 has been very small and the average size and the average time in buffer B2 has been exactly nothing. No, no delays in that buffer at all. And the statistics for the machines, we looked at last time at the chart statistics here. We can see 100% busy for M1 and very busy for M2 now we've made the cycle time 
um, 5.9. And so everything's working like clockwork, uh, but we're going to disrupt that. We're going to double click on M1 and then we're going to enter a distributional timing in here. So instead of three, I'm going to put the cursor in that field and then go to the model assistant and select a distribution section of that model assistant. And then I'm going to right click on the uniform distribution and say insert with distribution wizard. This now I'm going to put a minimum time of two and a maximum time of four. So no longer are we going to have a, a cycle time of three for that machine, but it could be anywhere randomly between two and four. And the uniform distribution just says that has equal probability for any of those values between two and four. If we OK that, it will put the expression that we need into the cycle time. This tells Witness to do a sample from a uniform distribution with a minimum of two and a maximum value of four. So every cycle time will be sampled from that and everyone will be different. And of course, this mimics the variation that you might well find in the real world. So we can re-zero the model by pressing begin and we can start the model running again and we can observe the behavior. What we'll do is we'll do the same experiment. We'll batch the model. I'll stop the model again and we'll batch it on to time 10,000. And this time you'll see certain cues are building up in the model. And this is quite common where you have variations in timings. It's going to disturb the harmonious behavior of a system. So let's quantify that by going back to the element tree, selecting all the elements, looking at the statistics, and we can now see that the average time in the system for P1 and P2 is now into the 20 minutes. The buffer sizes of B1, the average size has been 4.4, but the maximum size it's reached has been 12. The maximum size between the two machines in B2, that there has been at one point a queue of four parts waiting between there. And if we look at the utilizations of the machines, M1 is now not exactly 100% utilized. There's been a time when it's been starved of parts because of that variation in the cycle time. Very small, but it's distinctly there. So with that delay in the buffer, what if, and if we re-zero the model, what if we don't have space between M1 and M2 for the four parts, which we're told is the maximum? So we can double click on the buffer. And one of the things that's a characteristic of, the, of, a, of a buffer is its capacity. And let's say there's just room for one part between machine one and machine two in buffer B2. So we'll OK that change and then we'll run the experiment again by beginning and batching the experiment again. Now with that limitation on that buffer, we see that the problem with the buffer B1 and the delays back through machine M1 have been exacerbated. So let's look at the statistics again to quantify that. And we can see that now the average time for each of the parts getting through the system is up into the 40 minutes. The queue in buffer B1 has reached a maximum of 28 and on average has been 11.25. The maximum in the uh, size of the buffer B2, of course, is one because we've constrained it to be a maximum of that size. It's not always used. The average size has been 0.36. Now, because that uh, buffer B2 has, has been full occasionally, it has blocked machine M1. And we can see that in the blocked statistic here of 0.83% of the time that M1 has been blocked from outputting. And if we go into the colors here, you can just see a little bit of magenta at the far right hand uh, side of this, um, of this bar for M1. And this is showing us that that operation has been blocked. 
And of course, we know that the cycle time of that operation is matched up exactly to the input uh, times of P1 and P2. So if there's any blockage of that machine, then that's what's causing the blockage back into the queues uh, behind here. So we can see in this model that the statistics help us explore the effects of the variation and look to see how they affect the process. That's the end of tutorial two. Join me back for tutorial three. We'll, we'll look into uh, some more interesting routing in models.